Every next level of your life will demand a different version of you. Why? Because life is about reaching outside of your comfort zone, acclimating until you are comfortable, and then repeating the process. Every time you leave the familiar, you are granted a new set of armor. As Jim Rohn said, if you want to have more, you have to become more. For things to change, you have to change. For things to get better, you have to become better. If you improve, everything will improve for you. And every time we expand ourselves, we are forced to change in some way, evolve. So many of us fall into the trap of waiting for the perfect moment to jump. There is no perfect moment. How could there be? There's no perfect time to step out into a world you're not prepared for. But that's life. We jump and we grow wings on the way down. We step into the chaos and acclimate. By walking into the dark, we are forced to become the light. This makes staying where you are the most dangerous thing you can do. Let's use our imagination for a second. Let's say you reach for the next thing. You stretch yourself, move towards something you really want, and you fall short. Okay, time to breathe, reassess, step back for a second, and reapproach. A little better this time, a little wiser this time. As long as one remains engaged in this cycle, growth is inevitable. But now, let's say you never step in. Let's pretend the idea of moving into the unknown is too much. You'd rather stay with the familiar, pain-free, you think to yourself. But you would, in fact, be wrong. See that discomfort, one step up? It would force you to evolve. To see yourself as someone who steps into hostile territory and survives. And maybe it's not pretty. Maybe it's not perfect, but you attack and you survive. And sure, the difference between where you are now and only one step up isn't much. But what about that second step or evolution? Because you'd miss out on that too. And the third and the fourth and the compounding that would completely redefine who you are. From your self-identity to your skill set, from the mental to the physical, you put the whole chain reaction on hold because why? You didn't want to take one step. You didn't want to be uncomfortable in the short term. But discomfort is not a punishment. It is a ticket to everything you could ever imagine. So when the crowd runs out, I challenge you to run in. And when the world goes left, I dare you to go right. Not because the masses are evil, but because human beings are wired to take the path of least resistance. But you, no, not you. You're here to rise above the mental constraints that hold so many down. Because there is always another level. When you feel good, there is another level, and when you don't, there is another level. And see, our world has been defined not by the best or the brightest, but the ones willing to throw themselves into foreign arenas and compete. To see adversity as the answer, not the problem. You want to change your world, then change yourself. You want to change yourself, then go where you are scared to go. Where your heart beats and your hands sweat, Turn and face the direction you know you should have been facing. This is about you. This is about what you can become by simply saying yes when most would say no. Today is yours. Not because it was given to you, but because you looked through the haze and you decided it's so. I was in the middle of a workout the other day, and right before things got intense, right before we picked it up a level, I heard someone say, brace yourselves, your minds are about to start 
lying to you. Now, note, the message was not, brace yourselves, you're about to lose focus. Brace yourselves, things are going to get challenging, the path's going to be unclear. No, the message was much, much simpler. That we would be told lies, objectively. And who would tell them? Well, the adversary within each of us. The dark side of the moon, right? Just as there's light, there's darkness. Just as we have the tools to build, we have the tools to tear down. In fact, our life trajectories hinge on whether we find those reasons we can or we find reasons we can't. Whether we push those so-called lies away or embrace and adopt them. But here's what I loved most about that comment, why I found it so uh, moving. You know, I'm someone who's fascinated by the power of mindset. Obviously, I read about it, I experiment with it, I talk about it almost every day. But I guess in my head, I'd compartmentalized it as something slightly more subjective, right? We'll call it negative self-talk, you know, as, as an obstacle as chaos we have to learn to navigate. And while that's not wrong, there's something about the simplicity of you can do this and any thought in your head that says otherwise is a lie that's freeing. That message is like removing shackles because that voice in your head, and you can call it a distraction, a battle, you can call it the unknown, you can call it whatever you want. But the bottom line is, it's an untruth. You're strong enough to handle the now, period. You are strong enough. Because the liar in you says, you need to know what X minutes, X hours, X days down the road will look like. Oh, you don't? Well, then you can't handle this. It says, you need to sustain this pace or maintain this momentum. Imagine how bad that will hurt. You see that? You can't endure that. The liar in you says, you're not as strong as the ones who did it before you. You see them? They're better. The liar in you will do whatever it can to protect your ego at the expense of your growth. It wants to push off any type of pain because the liar in you knows one thing and one thing only, safety. So as you put your head down and embark upon the journey of life, remember that when things get tough, much of what you will be told will be untrue. And the vast majority of that won't be external. It will be derived from whatever entity manufactures the thoughts floating around in your head. Winning is calling that liar out, stopping it in its tracks. Winning is saying, there's no proof on earth that suggests I can't take another step forward, and then another, and then another. There's absolutely zero evidence that you can't take what's being given to you and not only survive the moment, but thrive. See, when you hold the pen, anything seeking to tell you how the story ends is simply, definitionally, unequivocally not true. Not unless you want it to be. Because the story and its ending are yours. What will become truth is what you write down. Line by line, moment by moment, day by day. So when the liar speaks, understand what she is and keep writing. And when the liar cries out, understand his intentions and keep building. If you want this moment, it's yours. And that is truth.
One of my favorite anecdotes or, or mantras is work hard in silence. Let success be your noise. That idea in my mind is perfection. Let your growth, your evolution, and yes, ultimately your accolades do this speaking for you. This always hit home for me for two reasons. One, because things of value come with a hefty price tag. We know this. Excellence requires sacrifice. It is in many ways both a daunting and worthwhile pursuit. And two, well, because we often conflate flailing around with progress. In fact, some of my favorite books, whether it be Deep Work by Cal Newport, Relentless by Tim Grover, The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday, uh, part of what captivates me uh, with these is the emphasis on what we are willing to do in silence, behind the scenes. That's where true meaning and value materializes. It's also where it's most difficult to commit and continue forward because in silence, there is no audience clapping for you. There is no validation. When you're building and reading and improving, when you're at the gym or on those calls, establishing that foundation, putting in the hours, it's easy to look around and have doubts. And our brains go, I did the work, where's the reward? I sacrificed, so where's the payout? It's not intuitive to understand that, hey, it's not visible yet. One of my favorite uh, metaphors, the lily pad pond, in which there is a pond with lily pads doubling in size every day. And on day 30, the pond is completely covered with them. So what day was the pond half covered? And if we're thinking quickly, we might be inclined to say, well, half of 30 is 15, so it was half covered on day 15. But that's wrong because if they're doubling every day, that pond wasn't half covered until day 29 and only a quarter covered on day 28. Meaning every day before then, the change was so small that perhaps it wasn't even visible to the naked eye. So small that to onlookers, the prospect of it one day being covered might have seemed far-fetched. But what was at work was the necessary change to set the stage. To start what would ultimately become the exponential growth that is noticeable, impactful. Now, of course, lily pads are not human, but little thought experiment, let's say they had been. I'd like to believe that talking about their growth, their plans, right, them screaming about how great they are and what they will someday be would not have helped them grow faster. In fact, it might have potentially even distracted the necessary evolution. The growth was not them versus the world, it was them versus them. And that's the idea, right? It's okay to work on you, to make a deal, sign a contract with yourself that you are doing something now that only you understand. That won't be visible until a later date. Let success be your noise. Because there's often zero correlation between the loudest person and the one making the greatest impact. Let success be your noise because you can't fake competency. Let success be your noise because leaders don't need to proclaim they lead and winners don't need to prove they've won and virtuous people don't advertise their virtue. It's in the doing. That's where we pay the price, the steep price. I've always said the last 10 years for me, the hardest part wasn't failing. It was not when things didn't go as planned. The hardest part was simply not knowing. It was the whisper that, hey, all this could be for naught. That I'm wasting my time. That the whole idea is a car without wheels. And that's what hurt. But if I could go back in time, talk to my younger self, I would say, you know, all this, all of it, the ups, downs, highs, lows, it's making you who you need to be. 
And if something doesn't work or go as you planned it originally, relax. You learn, you adjust, and you move forward. That's how the doubling of lily pads, right, using the same metaphor, occurs. You're learning, you're growing, and that's a you thing. I talked a few weeks ago now about the difference between a fee and a fine, as discussed in The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. The weight of not knowing, it isn't a fine, it's not a penalty, it's the fee. It's the cost to get into the show, the ticket to something greater. But you have to walk through that door. Again, it's a decision, it's personal, it's a commitment. It's nothing that screaming and seeking attention brings. You have to trust yourself, believe in yourself, right? Your effort is doubling in size. It's compounding exponentially, and you don't need to convince others. You need to stay consistent and build yourself up until the world has to notice. Trust the mission you're on. As long as you're one, moving forward, and two, learning and adjusting, you are destined for something greater. By committing, you have stacked the deck. By believing in yourself, you have rigged the game. It's about hearing and believing that voice that says, there's more in store for those who take it. And you are capable of that. That's the decision that will ultimately ring so loud, it will echo through time. How much did you care? What do you mean? I didn't understand the question at first. In that room, how much did you care what they thought of you? Like if zero is not at all and 10 is you cared a lot, how much did you care? Hmm, eight, I said, probably around an eight out of 10. And that is the problem. Because if you care, you are not free. I've been working my whole life to obtain that word in its truest sense, freedom. And I made progress. The world around us is tough to change, but most things worth changing are tough. I've uprooted and walked away from people that brought me down plenty of times. I've walked away from places that just weren't me. I've committed to carving out a path that I deem meaningful in my life. See, but you can always turn your back and walk away from people, from places, from situations. Here's a little caveat no one seems to tell you about, though. You have to take yourself with you. There's no destination to which you can arrive without your thoughts. There's no place you can show up without your narratives or your view of the world. And the more I navigate this floating rock we're on, the more I'm convinced that weather is determined by the onlooker, not the atmosphere. Some people simply choose to see sun. Some people choose rain. Our forecasts are internal. I've referenced this book often because it's one of the few cheat codes, not to any subset of reality, but to life in general that allows us to reverse engineer true contentment. It's called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying by Bronnie Ware, where she speaks with mostly older people during their final days, asks them what they would do differently if they could do it all over again. Regret number one, and we can actually stop right there, is I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the one others expected of me. Meaning, the number one thing people wish they did differently 
was careless. They wished they'd lived in their authenticity, put more weight on their goals and their dreams than those of strangers that pass like ships in the night. Every time we repress who we are, our future selves shed a tear. And I know that's not pretty or uplifting to think about, right? A future you looking down and wishing you'd sought out that freedom in its truest form, the freedom to live fully. But look, sometimes carving meaning out of life just isn't pretty. Sometimes what's necessary is not pretty. See, everything's relative. And perhaps understanding that it's not others who are the judge, but it's instead that older version of you sitting on the bedside, reflecting back on this one roller coaster ride. Maybe that's who we're living for. That's the well from which our courage should be drawn. We are guests passing through a miracle with minds that falsely and irresponsibly whisper, we have all the time in the world, trying to convince us that the trip lasts forever. But it doesn't. Your life is a raindrop in a thunderstorm. It will be over as fast as it arrived and how you choose to live it will be everything. See, there will always, in some capacity, exist that voice asking you to dial it down. There will, from time to time, be sweaty palms and shaking knees. You know, those human things. But when you find yourself standing on the edge of that door, looking out at a world that you know calls your name, let your voice be louder than all of it. Let the beating of your heart be stronger than your fear. And if you can't do it for you, then please do it for that version of you years from now, looking out the window, smiling about how you almost said no. You almost boxed yourself in. You almost let what matters pass you by. But instead, you captured life like a child chasing down a firefly that in a world of constraint, you allowed yourself to be free. Sometimes the moment has a way of appearing bigger than it really is. A facade. Let me explain. There was this kid when I was in first grade. Let's just call him Mike. And what Mike would do was follow us all around the classroom and outside at recess. Would constantly look for reasons to quote unquote, tell the teacher on you. Right, dude was an absolute menace. I'm 35, and I still remember Mike. My buddies and I would be, you know, playing basketball outside. Uh, you know, maybe just learn some awesome four-letter words. Would love to give him a test run, but no, not if Mike was around. Mike would go right to the teacher. And see, we feared Mike because we feared being in trouble. Now, as time passes... Yeah, you look back and realize how absolutely ridiculous that is. I want to uh, shake younger me and say, who cares about Mike? Go live your life. He doesn't matter. But the reality is at the time, he did matter. He mattered a lot because he was the personification of uh, what was most scary to us in the moment. Right? As a child, avoiding being in trouble or time out or whatever it was uh, seemed to be a big deal. And here's what I think. I think every chapter of life has a mic. Not in the literal sense, but in the sense that there's something we fear, something that consumes our time and attention. Something that's been inflated to a state far greater than it really should have been. 
that has an impact disproportionate to reality. Because as real as it seems in the moment, a few years down the road, we'll do the usual, you know, shake our head and laugh about the seemingly obvious lack of perspective during that chapter. Hindsight being 2020, we'll be shocked we couldn't see what we eventually came to see. But that's what growth is. It's a good thing. We want to evolve. No one wants to be the same in 10 years, see life the same way in 10 years. But it's also an opportunity to obtain some perspective, to understand that our current fears aren't all we've built them up to be. We just can't see it yet. Unfortunately, the dust has to settle before the picture makes sense. Just like right now, we can't judge the world around us the same way historians will be able to with clarity. That's why I often reference Ronnie Ware's top five regrets of the dying, because it's a list of things people in their final stages of life look back on and say, yeah, that was dumb. It's people who have already walked the path pointing out the metaphorical mics they've encountered along the way, because here's the deal, the root of our stagnation, the root of our frustration, our despair, comes down to fear in some capacity, right? When you dig deep, it's a fear of leaving or staying, a fear of criticism, fear of unknowns, fear of letting down the people we do know. Our demons are manufactured. They're comprised of fear, fear that, sure, we'll eventually laugh and shrug off. But oh, the power in being able to fast forward that sequence, to understand that life is too short to be held down by chains of our own making, right? How about laughing in the face of what intimidates you now? Not five years from now, but now. How about looking around and asking yourself what obstacles in your life are Mike-esque? How about breaking our constraints down into what they've always been manageable tasks? Simply waiting for us to change the narrative. If you aren't pursuing that which is meaningful, it's most likely because somewhere deep down, fear is holding you back. And that fear is holding you back because let's face it, you've let it in. See, the moment is beautiful. It's powerful. It has everything you need, but it's not bigger than you. It never will be bigger than you. So let's not wait for some arbitrary time in the future to arrive at that conclusion. Jack Welch has said, control your own destiny or someone else will. And I'm passing this along today as I believe it's uh, one of the most important things to understand. Not a once and done thing, but a reoccurring question. Where have I relinquished control? How can I recapture what matters most? As the world around us shifts, slips and slides, so does our grasp on it which is why I find this continuous self-reflection so powerful. I have a flight this afternoon, which means I have a hard deadline and a lot I need to do before I head down to the Miami airport. I've been traveling a lot recently, which means I've been finding myself in this situation a lot recently. And here's what's become abundantly clear to me as I work through the logistics. On travel days, I'm exponentially more productive than on my typical quote-unquote work day. I wake up with a, an urgency and sense of control over my time that apparently is lacking on, say, your typical Tuesday. And I'm shot out of a cannon. Today, for example, I've worked out, written and recorded two speeches, counting this one, recorded short video content sent to my editors, planned next week's topics, might even have time to go live and hang out for a few minutes. And I'm sitting here thinking, 
You know, dude, if I had uh, a flight at noon every day, I'd be worth $500 million by June. What is the difference between today and every other day? Simple. My approach towards it. How I utilize and control the resources at my disposal. This is a powerful, powerful thing to realize. You know, it begs the question, how can this urgency be manufactured? Because that's what it's about, right? Setting up the parameters so that they are most conducive to our success. Another life-changing quote I came across a few years ago was, you are your own experiment. Meaning life is about testing things, trying different methods, exploring different approaches, and also having the discipline to observe their outcomes. Why? So that you can use that information to position yourself for success. That info is as good as gold. One, understanding, and two, implementing. So that, you know, we're not pushed back and forth by external factors like leaves in the wind, but are instead creating our own ideal circumstances. These, let's just call them travel days, have helped me realize how much power, energy, control I relinquish on a typical day. And most importantly, how I can change that. You know, time for a new experiment. Let's try approaching every day like there's a hard cutoff at noon. How? I'm not sure yet. I'll test and explore until something clicks. But there's definitely some information worth noting. I've picked up my phone zero times today, which is obviously valuable. I've second-guessed my messaging and communication a lot less. Don't have time to waste on the small things. Nope, not when you fly out at noon. This is information I'll take with me. Little nuggets of wisdom uh, that I've been able to collect. And so I'll finish with an important reminder that this is not so much about efficiency as it is about awareness and a willingness to adapt. Right? Like becoming a robot is not the goal here. Um, but the discipline to step outside yourself and look at how you're spending your time so that you can make it more valuable and meaningful is. We let the outside world dictate far too much and we don't even realize. We just sort of move through it. We relinquish control because we had no idea it was ours to take. We are very often unaware of the power that we have over ourselves, our circumstances, and our lives in totality. We're unaware of just how much value we walk right by. The opportunity is not days, weeks, or months away. It lives with you now. Every breath, every step, every decision. You just have to open your eyes and invite it in. I was in Arizona last week, got a chance to interview Joe Polish, best-selling author and founder of the Genius Network. As I was sort of making my way around the uh, Genius Network office with my coffee that morning, I noticed in one of the meeting rooms there were some quotes hanging on the wall. One of them was Joe's. It said, be willing to destroy anything in your life that is an excellent. That's certainly a big statement. I started thinking about my little corner of the universe, running through all the things that might not meet that standard of excellence in my life. And a few certainly came to mind. It was freeing to think about. But could excellence really be a standard for everything? I mean, that's a high bar. And so I wrote it down, a little reminder to bring it up later during the interview. A few hours go by, mics are rolling, and I ask the question. So, be willing to destroy anything in your life that is an excellent. Beautiful quote. But how? And uh, Joe smiled, kind of paused for a sec. Says, willing. 
right? The key word there is willing. And I'm paraphrasing. But his point was essentially, it's an acceptance of what is and a willingness to be rigorously honest with yourself. Because look, there's not an athlete, entrepreneur, parent, or student who didn't have to at some point play broken. We all do. But to live like that, that's not a life well lived, that's learned helplessness. And that quote on the wall is about taking a stand. It's the moment you say, I want a new standard for my life. I'm going to be more assertive more caring, more aware. Excellence is not a requirement per se, because human beings can't be excellent all the time. We are flawed, we are trying, we are growing. But what you can do is look around you and start moving towards that version of yourself. Start cutting away the metaphorical chains around your ankles. In his book, What's in it for them, Joe highlights British Olympic rower, Ben Hunt Davis, who had one standard for the men in his boat. One question that would be asked every time they were confronted with the decision. The question was, will this make the boat go faster? If no, then it's not for them. And this framework guided their journey. This contributed to their success, this clarity, this line of sight. It's an awareness we can all learn from. Understanding that we're not shackled to yesterday. We're not tied to the old stories, the old relationships, the old ways of living. No, our paths are not dictated by what was, but rather our willingness to be aware, to ask the questions that position us towards our North Star. And as the conversation was winding down, Joe pointed to a quote from the movie Vanilla Sky. It states, every passing minute is another chance to turn it all around. Change doesn't happen without the understanding that more is possible. That perhaps you'd been conceding too much while asking too little of yourself. Perhaps you've been surrounding yourself with inadequate resources. Maybe you've been building walls that without your knowing it became self-induced limitation. And yeah, excellence in every single aspect of life is unobtainable. But what a beautiful standard. What a journey to embark upon, a horizon to chase down. And the point is not to recklessly destroy your current reality, but to build a bridge connecting what is to what can be. It's loving the reflection in the mirror enough to know you are better. You can be better. You will obtain better. You need not be perfect or flawless, but you must be willing. Willing to destroy anything in your life that is an excellent. We are, in some ways, helpless to what occurs around us. There are things that are beyond our control. But the gift we possess, our power, if you will, is the ability to determine what we let in, how we internalize the externalities. We are responsible for being the gatekeepers of our minds, protectors of our worlds. There's a little saying that I aim to live by. It's incredibly simple. Basically, the idea is, if something is not a net positive on your life, start working to eliminate it. If there's a person that is draining, creating more negative than positive, then they don't deserve to be in your world. Stop letting them in. If there's some place you're going that doesn't align with what you value, 
Start working to eliminate that destination from your day today. Stop letting it in. If you find yourself constantly thinking about worst case scenarios, it's always, well, what if this goes wrong or that goes wrong? If you find yourself missing the opportunity and instead spotlighting the problem, start working to identify and isolate those thoughts so that they can be eliminated. Stop letting that stuff in. The great part about having so much control over our lives and our perspectives is that we get to choose what gets our time and attention. The tough part though, and it is tough, is that it means we also have to ask ourselves questions that perhaps we don't want to ask. We have to be honest with ourselves, like truly honest. And the reality is sometimes it hurts to do that, to ask, how am I contributing to this pain, this struggle? What am I letting in that needs to be kept outside the gate from now on? And what we often find is that the answers are there. The opportunity is there, sometimes even in plain view. But our attention is often diverted from it and instead allocated to the things that don't even serve us or align with who we are. We've habitualized finding the problems and not the solutions. And I can list examples of this uh, over the course of my life all day, right? Epiphanies where I realized I needed to defend the thoughts that enter my mind and better cultivate a world where I can succeed, where I can be happy. Money, for example, the switch from seeing it as a scarce resource, something that everyone's fighting over, how to outmaneuver the guy to the right of me, how to get my hands on this elusive object. Nope block that mentality at the gate and let in instead the idea that money is merely an exchange of value. How can I be more valuable to more people? Where value goes, wealth follows. Or as I've talked about before, the injuries I deal with so frequently, right? Keeping the poor me or I can't deal with this or whining, I'm willing to put in the work. Why won't life let me succeed? Keep all that outside the gate and let in. Here is an opportunity to get better in other areas. I can't lift. Maybe I'll take a month or two to crush cardio, to eat better, to build mental acuity. Find a way. Or maybe it's that person who made their way into my life that over time became a net negative. That we've gotten to the point where our coexistence takes away more than it adds. They no longer belong inside the gate, in my world, right? Only let in people who do make your life better. And we have control over all of this. It's about accountability. It's about personally understanding the authority you have over what comes in and what stays out. The very few things in life are just because. Things exist in our day to day because we have somewhere along the line allowed them to be there. So take some time to see yourself as the gatekeeper of your world. Audit what you're letting in and what you're keeping out. To do so will set you up for a life on your terms, a life that's not wasted or even merely endured, but one that's lived to the fullest. Peter Drucker has said that what gets measured gets improved. And this insight's been incredibly valuable to me over the years. I want to explain why. Until you measure something, you're operating in somewhat of a black box. You're essentially guessing, aiming at targets you can't see, which ultimately means you're leaving life up to chance. But once you begin to gauge your progress in a specified area, you now have information to work with. You have an increased sense of awareness and the ability to focus, which as I've said before, and believe wholeheartedly what you focus on 
becomes your reality. So here's a quick example that I think adequately uh, paints a picture here of what I'm talking about. Uh, way back when I first started my business, I was uh, chatting with a friend about wanting to grow my YouTube subscribers, add value to as many people as I possibly could with my work. Back then it was all YouTube. That was the crux of my business. And so the first question he asked, he goes, just out of curiosity, how many subscribers join the channel daily? And I realized in that moment, you know, I don't know. I knew the total amount, like I kept tabs on that, but not the sort of daily fluctuation, how much grew on Monday versus Friday, you know, that type of thing. Uh, and this guy, he had a tracker. He's very big on that. Basically a sheet with the most important things that he's trying to change in his life. And every day when he would wake up, he'd record a quick measurement in each of those categories. And my first thought was, eh, you know, that's a little over the top. It's a little extra. But hey, one of my favorite mantras is that you are your own experiment. And I was happy to try something new that, you know, could have a positive impact. And so I did. I started uh, recording daily the net subscribers that join the Your World Within community. And what I found was incredible. They say it's the simple things that make the greatest difference in our lives. And this would certainly be no exception, right? First and foremost, just seeing that number every day kept growth at the forefront of my mind. It kept me aware and excited and thinking through that lens as if I were on a journey or mission to outperform the me of yesterday, right? If on some random day you grow 30% more than you usually do, it's only normal to see that and ask, well, why can't this happen every day? Why can't this be my reality? And next, and, and probably more obvious, it armed me with the tools to tactically improve my performance. Those daily metrics helped me find critical answers, arrive at important conclusions. You know, what days of the week and weeks of the year have the greatest impact? What trends lead to increased viewership? My daily average subscriber count is X. I wonder what it would take to bring it to Y. Right? And so basically, instead of just showing up every day with my fingers crossed and hoping I'd hit it out of the park, I had a more informed approach. It's like taking a blindfold off. And all of this prompted by writing one little number down in the morning. The more I did this, the more it became obvious that it should be implemented in other aspects of my life. If this is important to me, if I say with conviction, this is an area I want to improve. How could I afford to not know the extent of its growth? And now I do track the handful of things I'm most invested in growing because those will be most impacted by my giving them attention. There's a saying that what you water grows. Well, your focus and your attention is what will water the seed, what will give it life. If you're looking to lose weight, but you never look at the scale, you're hurting yourself, right? And you might say, well, I don't want to be all about the numbers, right? It's a lifestyle change. And I certainly agree. The point is not to track every single step you make. It's to realize how often we operate blindly. It's to show you that with 100% certainty, your increased awareness and attention dedicated to any pursuit will make you more effective in bringing about your desired result. Knowing your daily progress keeps you in the game. It keeps you excited and also arms you with the tools to make the necessary changes. See, we are brilliant creatures capable of incredible things, but it's critical that we position ourselves so that we can win the game. It's critical that we not only look, but see. To be simplified, to condense life down to only what's important and to monitor those things that are important to you will give you a tremendous advantage. And again, this is basic stuff, but we skip the basic stuff because we think the big changes come from complexity. They don't. They come from choosing a target and working to get closer and closer to its bullseye. Like Greg McCune says in Essentialism, growth often has nothing to do with the acquisition of more, 
Sometimes it's about eliminating the things we don't need and focusing on that which we do. Now I'm suggesting we take it one step further and measure our growth as we take those meaningful things into the great unknown. Life can be challenging, that's no secret. So why not arm ourselves with every advantage available to us? Why not keep yourself excited and invested and knowledgeable? Often we look around at what we don't have and think, man, I could never have what they have. I could never do what he or she does. The reality is they identified what matters and brought it to life one small step at a time. And guess what? You can do the same. It's not a miracle you need, it's awareness. So here's to keeping your eyes open, to not only looking but seeing, and in doing so, getting results from the opportunity we otherwise would walk right by. Find a way. Because first and foremost, there always is one. Find a way because you are more than strong enough. Because anything other than a solution or some semblance of progress means you gave in, called it quits, threw in the towel, and giving in is not who you are. Find a way, because that discomfort today, well, it becomes our greatest source of pride tomorrow. The simple decision to carry on or stick it out now is so much more than it appears to be when under duress. Sure, it's easy to turn around, but everything, everything relies on your moving forward into that darkness. Find a way. Because while we may think we want safety and need predictability, our souls want adventure. Life's meaning is comprised of the mountains climbed and dragons slayed, so step out and slay your dragons. Find a way. Because an evolved self has to be earned. Keeping promises to yourself is no small ordeal. Putting your head on the pillow at night, knowing you followed through on who you decided you would be, that's power. It creates a trajectory towards infinite possibility, it points you at the stars. Find a way because you must reinforce the fact that the world is clay to be molded, not a checklist. It's a game, not a chore, a gift, not an obligation. When you find a way, you become the ruler of your own kingdom. Look, there exists a way, a path. That's not the question. The question is one of effort. Is there a willingness to move beyond the parameters imposed upon you by others, by the past, by the thoughts that bounce around in your head? 
Is there a willingness to endure duress in the short term? Is there a willingness to fall down now, to look dumb, to not always be perfectly packaged or assembled? Are you willing to endure that in exchange for the infinite? I remember hearing the mantra, there is always a way to get to your finish line. It's not, can I? It's not, is it possible? No, it's how. How do I get there? The dots exist. You have to be the one to connect them. You have to build bridges over the oceans of unknowns. The valleys comprised of the unforeseen. Oh, there is a way. Remember that. Remember that it's not the destination that's in question, but one's willingness to knock and knock and knock until the right door opens. Remember that you have everything you need, that you are armed with all that is required. You were made to connect those very dots before you. You just have to decide what's more important to you. That feeling of reaching the top of the mountain or the feeling of its shade at the bottom. What will you give to be more than you've ever been? Do more than you've ever done? There is always a way. Are you willing to find it? I was taking a walk a few days ago and was listening to an audiobook called 10X is Easier Than 2X by Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy. And this is a book essentially about how exponential growth requires a reframing, a change to the way we think about ourselves and the journeys that we're on. And in it, Sullivan states, and I'm paraphrasing, the things that brought you to the current moment will keep you there powerful, and a lens through which I hadn't really looked at my personal growth or journey before. I've always thought of progress as uh, a stacking of repeatable habits over and over again. And while this may not be wrong, Sullivan and Hardy make a pretty effective argument that it's only part of the story. See, if you show up and you do the exact same thing every day, You'll get growth, no doubt, but it will be linear in nature. Exponential growth requires instances of, of self-recreation, you know, of evolution as we make our way forward. It's a continuous uh, pushing aside of things we don't need to be doing and a simultaneous deep dive into the things that bring us the most return. They use the uh, example of the famous Michelangelo, who was known for his paintings, right? And then some time goes by and he produces a 17-foot statue of David. And then he pivots again as he's commissioned by Pope Julius II to uh, paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And then moves on to direct even larger projects. And each example here is a 10x evolution. Certainly not a road that could have been mapped out from day one. How would he ever have known? But it's a series of sometimes even lateral moves. Instances of following your intuition, your strength, doing what felt right, right? Instances of breaking down and building back up the self. Same foundation of talent and skill, same general competency but he continuously stacked new and enhanced versions of himself uh, on top of one another. Sometimes reminders hit you exactly when you need to hear them. You know, personally, I loved 
everything about this message. The idea that there should be more emphasis and courage for that matter on one's 10X trajectory, multiplying my strengths on taking the value I bring to the world and putting it through some stressors, seeing what comes out the other side. Because the danger in playing it safe, which the second we stop being intentional about things is ultimately uh, what we tend to do, it, it's that you don't experience that transformation. It was not safe, using the same metaphor from Michelangelo, a painter, to create David, right? The safe thing would have been to keep doing the same thing every day. But you have to trust your skill, your heart, and your intuition. There's immense value in all of us understanding that and to some degree emulating it. There's value in all of us finding our David Stepping into that, which is a little unclear, makes us a little nervous, but at the same time allows us to take the skills and talents, the parts of us that are most meaningful, and inject them into the world in a bigger way, which would never have been possible had we stayed the same. The things that brought you to the current moment will keep you there. Well, here's to finding your 20%, that which matters, and using it as the template with which you paint. Not getting so stuck in the routine that you forget the routine is a means, not an end. You have the ability in your own unique way to change the world around you. The question is, do you have the courage to reach for it?